Yael, should we start? Yes, I think so. Okay, we start. Dear colleagues, good afternoon to our Chinese participant and good morning to our Israeli participant. I, Professor Itamar Vilner, member of the Israel Academy of Sciences and Humanities, and Professor Yu Liang Zhao, member of the Chinese Academy of Sciences, act as co-chairs of the Biacademic Webinar Meeting on Nanotechnology. The Israel Academy of Sciences and Humanities and the Chinese Academy of Sciences have long-term scientific cooperations reflected by many mutual scientific meetings in various fields, exchange of scientists, students, and most importantly, friendship. Israel praises the scientific advances promoted by the Chinese Academy of Sciences in China and values the scientific collaboration between the academies. Two years ago, we decided to host in Jerusalem, a bioacademic meeting in the area of nanotechnology. Unfortunately, due to the corona pandemic and, and several delays to conduct a frontal meeting, we decided to realize this effort by having a series of four webinars in several subtopics of nanotechnology. Due to the time differences between Israel and China, we were forced to limit each of the webinars to four lectures and appropriate following discussions. The four webinars will address the topics of nano devices and nanophotonics today, energy and the environment as the second webinar, self-assembly and biomaterial, the third webinar, and nanomedicine and nanobiology, the fourth nano uh, webinar. I realize that many scientists from both countries are disappointed for not being able to present the research, yet I hope that all will understand our restricted time limitations. We had to overcome many obstacles and in organizing these webinars uh, series. And I would like to thank the co-chair, Professor Zhao, Dr. Xiao from the Foreign Affairs Office, the National Center of Nanoscience and Technology, and Ms. Zhao, the program officer, the Bureau from the Bureau of International Cooperation, the Chinese Academy of Sciences for their continuous help and support. I would like to thank the scientific chairpersons, the moderators and all speakers participating in these webinars. Particularly, I would like to thank the staff of the Israel Academy of Sciences Ms. Galia Finzi, the director of the academy, Joe Cohen, the director of the international relations, Naama Shiloni, head of the public relations, Yaakov Rotman from the computing department of the academy for their continuous efforts and helps, and to Mr. Arik Futterman for the technical production of the event. Last but not least, I would like to thank Dr. Yael Ben Chaim, the Secretary of the Science Division of the Israel Academy of Sciences, for her daily efforts and sleepless nights to organize these webinars. Her contribution to this event is invaluable. On behalf of Professor Nili Cohen, President of the Israel Academy of Sciences, 
and humanities. I am delighted to open the webinar series and I wish all of you a simulating scientific, simulating scientific discussion. As the co-chair, Professor Yuliang Zhao is unable to join me for opening remarks due to other commitments, I am honored to invite Professor Jiwang Tang, Deputy Director of the National Center of Nanoscience and Technology to greet the participants. Please, Professor Tang. Thanks, Professor Weller. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Israel-China bilateral series in nanotechnology. China and Israel has made phased achievements in practical cooperations in the fields of nanoscience and nanotechnology. The platform constructions has been pushed continually and friendly. The scientific exchanges have been intensified consistently. The, co uh, the cooperations has displayed uh, fruitful highlights in talent cultivation, bilateral meetings, and the joint project application. The Israel-China bilateral series in nanotechnology mainly focus on the latest progresses and the future development trend of science, nanoscience, and technology, especially the preparation, characterization, application, as well as development trend of various nanomaterials, nanostructures, and the related nanodevices. It provides a high-level exchange the platform for the scientists in the field of nanotechnology and the later solid foundations for long-time exchanges and collaborations in the field of nanotechnology between China and Israel. I hope that such collaborations will provide an uh, understanding opportunity for academic exchanges, technology innovations, discussions on the future prospect, exchange the people, and share our research policy as well as the resources. Finally, I wish a great success of the conference. Thank you. So thank you very much. Uh, my name is Yossi Paltiel and I together with Professor Ni from China and Uriel Levy from Israel, uh, we will host this first uh, conference on nano devices and nanophotonics. I'm very happy to open this meeting and I want to be strict on time since we have a busy program. We have four lectures and then a discussion. Please stay for the discussion. And if you have any questions, please mark them on the chat. The first speaker of today's uh, meeting is a uh, our distinguished professor from the Technion, uh, Moti Segev. Moti Segev is an expert in nano devices and nanophotonics. He is uh, working on nonlinear optics, on photonics, on soliton. He's a pioneer in soliton, and he won several or many prizes uh, along his fruitful career. He is uh, in, the, in the Israeli Academy of Science, in the United States Academy of Science. He won the Israeli Prize, which is the highest award given in Israel for science, the Emet Prize, and many others. So without further notice, I will let you, Moti, give us your new idea on uh, nano devices and on a uh, uh, topological laser. Thanks, you, Moti. Thank you very much. I'm really happy to be here in this uh, meeting and I would have liked that this meeting is actually uh, in person, which is much better in my opinion. Let me just do the technology, install the technology. Hmm? One last thing, if you have a question, please ask them on chat and I will ask Moti, so, uh, because you don't have the right to interfere. So thank okay, you very much. Okay, uh, let me do this and also... Du duplicate, duplicate. Yeah, yeah, I did and now I just need to see the... 
Yeah, this is winter, and then uh, well, okay, okay. So um, I'm going to talk about topological photonics and the most important application of it, at least today, uh, topological insulator laser. So my name is Moti Segev, and the Technion team that worked on this area actually started this area, this whole field. It started in 2013 in my group, the Technion. Today it's a field of hundreds, many hundreds of people, and there are quite a few hundreds already in China working on topological photonics. Some of the people that pioneered this together with me is my former postdoc, Mikhail Rechstman, who is now associate professor at Penn State. Uh, you know, Tan Plotnik and Kobe Lumer, who are in the industry. Miguel Bandres, who is now uh, assistant professor at the Creole in the US. And I have one Chinese guy that came to China last year. Actually, uh, his name is Zhao Zhu Yang. He was supposed to stay uh, for another year, but he got stuck. He went to China to the new year last year, and he got stuck there uh, during the corona, and is now assistant professor at uh, Zhejiang uh, University in China. And I have the younger students, Eran and Lustig, Alex Dikopolce, Moshe Ishaq Cohen, Liak, and Rovsky. We collaborated, the work that you will see today, the beginning of it, it was all collaboration with Alex Zamait from the University of Rostock in Germany, who is my, was my postdoc, is now her professor doctor in Germany. And there is a, a large quantum part which we collaborated with a group of uh, Andrea Blanco Redondo. At the time, the beginning, she was a postdoc with Ben Eggleton. Later on, she became independent, but then she in Australia, and now she moved to the US. So I want to start by talking about topological insulators that are not in photonics. So what are they? They are materials that are insulators in the bulk, but have perfect conductance on the edges. So the way to think about it is to think about a two-dimensional material where the bulk cannot conduct current at all, and you have a conductance on the edge. The current on the edge is actually a superconductor. In other words, it will uh, conduct the current and uh, without, in one direction only, and without scattering back and without scattering into the bulk. So in other words, if you put some pieces of disorder or sharp corners or whatever you like, the current is still not scattered. It will still continue like perpetual motion around the edge only. The idea was conceived in 1988 by Duncan Aldane, at least the major part of that, uh, and then uh, was actually came to a physical system, closer to a physical system 2005, 2006, by Charlie Kane in 2005, and shortly after by Xu Sheng Zheng, who unfortunately died two years ago. Uh, otherwise, he would have been a contender for the Nobel Prize. This was 2006, and within a year there was experiment in, with electronics in the electronic system by Lawrence Mollenkamp from the University of Würzburg. So, what does it mean to have something that is superconducting on the edge? So, let's say that you encounter some obstacle, some defect. Okay, so here is a defect illustrated. And let's suppose that we have a wave coming in, which can be a classical wave, like an optical wave, or a quantum wave, like the wave function of an electron. So normally we would have part of that reflected and some part of that transmitted. So there are some particular potentials that are reflectionless. But here we are talking about a perturbation that could be disorder, could be a sharp corner or anything. The shape of the potential does not matter at all. And the question is, how can you avoid backscattering? The whole concept of topological insulators is that there is no backscattering, okay? So the way to do that for an arbitrary uh, shape of the potential, completely independent of the shape of the potential, is to make sure that the state you want to scatter into does not exist, okay? That already gives you a notion of some band gap. It turns out that it's not general enough, but today in the talk, we'll talk only about uh, uh, systems that have band gap, which means that systems that are periodic, they are on a lattice. So to understand what is going on, let's look at the two-dimensional lattice. So let's say that we have some kind of a lattice, a two-dimensional potential. Let's suppose that there is a band gap here, okay? And uh, this is a trivial band gap that does not have any of the features of the topological insulators. And now let's put some magnetic field. So what will happen is that if you look in the bulk at any lattice point, the currents in the bulk, the precession currents induced by the Lorentz force exerted by the uh, by the field on the electron, they will go around and around. By the magnetic field, they will go around and around, and here they will cancel out. If they are here, they are cancelled out. This one cancels out with this one, and so on and so forth. The only currents that are driven by the magnetic field that you apply, the only currents that are not cancelled out are on the edge, because outside you have vacuum or you have some normal material. So what you will have on the edge is just current that goes by jumping by hopping from one side to another. 
Now, if you look at this, then you can immediately understand that the current here on the edge is unidirectional, and the direction is determined by the relative sign between the spin of the electron and the magnetic field. And the bulk, as we said, all the currents are canceling out, so it's an insulator. So that explains why you have current on the edge and why the, the bulk is an insulator. But it does not explain why we have robustness, why we have supercurrent on the bulk. To understand that, we need to look at the dispersion curve that the dispersion curve of the bulk is that are two bands, but the dispersion of curve of the edge is the red line. Notice that the red line is only in one direction, okay? So there are several notions here. First of all, it's only one direction. To get a line on the other direction, you need either to flip the magnetic field or to flip the spin. So that means that if you do not have a, uh, any magnetic defect in the system, then you will have only this, only this line, okay? Now let's suppose that we launch a wave packet that is exactly in the Fermi level, in the middle of the band gap. What will happen to it, okay? So that usually that wave packet will now propagate with the group velocity that is the slope of this line, okay? So the slope, the group velocity of topological edge states in all topological systems in the world is always non-zero. It cannot be horizontal. It must have some inclination, okay? So then this explains why you have current. You always have current. You cannot avoid the current on the edge, okay? The next thing is, let's suppose now that you have disorder or some kind of a defect. So if the disorder is small enough in amplitude, such that it cannot couple between an edge state right here and the bulk, then what will happen is that in the presence of disorder or defects, what will happen is that the, you will slightly alter, slightly modify the, the bands, slightly modify the dispersion curve. So everything will move a little bit up and down, but will stay in this vicinity and will therefore stay only on the edge and cannot scatter back because there's no line on the other side and cannot couple to the bulk. Where the only restriction is that the amplitude of the defects or the disorder is smaller than half the band gap. Because if it is half the band gap or bigger, it can couple to the bulk and then you have coupling to bulk states. That's the logic. And well, we know this effect, it's called the integer quantum Hall effect, which today is included in the family of topological insulators, discovered in experiments by von Klitzing in 1980 and received the Nobel Prize for that. So what are the topological insulators that were discovered after that from 1988 and on? They are similar logic with one major difference that they do not require a magnetic field. They are based on other physics, on other effects. So if we want to take the lesson, what do we need? to have a topological insulator. So for a topological insulator, the main features are unidirectional transport on the edge. It's an immunity to scattering and defects, no back scattering, no scattering to the bulk, as long as the perturbation is smaller than half band gap. And there's another one. The other one is the conserved topological quantities. We like to call them the chair number. What is it? Now, if you think about a band, some band, first band or second band, whatever in solid state physics, um, or a band in, a, in an array of waveguides, for example, a block band, then usually we can look at the phase of each item on that. And when we teach it for the first time in undergraduate class, when we just look at one dimensional array of masses on springs and so forth, usually what we have is the band, the phase along the band will change in a uniform way. It starts all of them in the same phase and then the phase of the nearest, nearest neighbor starts to change and the edge of the brilliant zone is zero pi, zero pi, zero pi. Now let's take this and wrap it around itself and close like a Mobius ring, okay? What will happen now is that you have a twist. You have one twist in this. This is called winding number of one. And if you do it twice, you have winding number of two. So it turns out that topological systems have integer number of twists when the entire band is twisted around itself. The name Chern is interesting. He was a Chinese professor of mathematics, okay? And he was in Nankai University near TEDA, the high-tech center there, is buried in Ankai University. And the ideas are engraved on his tomb. Very, very interesting. So there is one more issue here to say that this is a rare case in physics where the size actually matters. The size of the band gaps, the band gap will tell you how much topological protection you have. Why is that? Because if the band gap is very, very small, then as a result of that, every little junk, every little disorder or perturbation will immediately couple the edge states into the bulk and you lose all the topological properties. However, in the band gap, if the band gap is large, then you have a lot of robustness and this is what we really want. 
So as soon as these ideas came out, uh, Duncan Alden immediately thought to ask himself, uh, is this, are these topological features, topological properties, are they unique to fermions or can we find them also in bosonic system? Uh, the reason that he asked this, he wanted to know uh, if we can extend the idea not only to quantum wave, but also to classical waves. Why? Because if the ideas survive in some way for bosonic systems, then electromagnetic waves are bosonic systems and, and, and uh, all kinds of classical waves, density waves and, and charge wave, and all kinds of them will be elastic waves and acoustic waves, mechanical waves, all of them will be, uh, will be like bosonic systems. So that's why he was motivated to extend it. And he wrote a paper in 2008 that was highly mathematical. In that paper, what he wrote practically, there is only one line that is important, that if you want to, uh, to take these ideas that were really generated in the fermionic system, you want to take it to bosonic systems like electromagnetic waves, you have to break time reversal symmetry. And he proposed some mathematical Hamiltonian where this can be done. It's very hard to read the paper, but there was one person that read the paper was, was inspired by it. Is my former student, uh, Marin Solicic, who is now a professor at MIT. And he had a very good uh, student from China, Wen Ji Wang, today is a professor in China, that did the first experiments. And what he saw in the first experiments, he understood this, uh, this uh, system and he designed a photonic lattice in the microwaves. And what you can see here, is that uh, this is the lattice, this is the lattice spacing of uh, four centimeters. And these, are the, these columns are rods, they are made from zero optic materials. They are made from materials that have the Faraday effect. And what you can see here is some perturbation on the edge. And as you can see here, you can see that the wave packet in the microwaves went around it and no scattering back. This is very, very nice, but why did it do in the microwaves? Because the, the mag magneto-optic effects are always extremely, extremely small for all frequencies above 10 terahertz, above 10 to the 12 hertz, maybe 10 to the 11 hertz. All natural materials have mu is equal to mu zero. So practically speaking, the Faraday effect there is very small. Now we photonics people, we know it. That means that we cannot really have devices, magneto-optic modulators or magneto-optic or, or optical isolators that are on the size of a wavelength. Rather, we need to propagate many wavelengths because the magneto-optic effects are weak. So here the question was, if we want to bring these effects to optical frequencies, magnetic response is weak. So topological band gap is very, very small. So there's practically no protection. How do we bring these nice ideas into the uh, optical regime? And there were about three years that people looked into it and came with all kinds of ideas. Many of them are completely unphysical. And in 2013, we made the first one. What we did, we designed photonic graphene. So what we had is the lattice of waveguides, two-dimensional lattice of waveguides that look, okay, you can think about them like fibers. They were not really fibers. They were made in the bulk by direct laser writing, but never mind that. Think about them like waveguides. And they were organized like graphene. So they were organized with a lattice on that is a honeycomb lattice that looks like this. And every waveguide like this was helical, which means that it went into the, black, into the, the blackboard like this like a spring, okay? So that get this helicity broke the symmetry of, of left and right, okay? And this is why we can, could see these effects. You can see here the photograph from the input facet. You can see each one of these is a, is a waveguide. They are slightly elliptic because of fabrication issues, but what matters is the coupling coefficient between nearest neighbors. And what you can see here is a little movie where we look at the output phase of this, and when we launch an edge state, and then we see it propagate on the edge. You see the edge that goes all the way on the edge and encounters the corner. Instead of having scattering, being scattered back and so forth, it goes down. And here is another one that shows what happens when you have less than 30 pieces, less than 30 waveguides. The light was launched at this corner at the input and you are looking at the output facet. And here there is a missing waveguide. So the light actually went around it, even though this has less than 30 unit cells. We published that in 2013. Today, it's considered a field opener. It has a close to 2,000 citations in just uh, seven or eight years. And uh, seven, six months after us, there was another group that did look that found chiral edge states in silicon photonics, a group of Muhammad Hafezi. Okay, today, there are many, many, many uh, uh, photonic topological insulators, but there are, one can classify them in like six major classes. This is the first one that has to do with geo-optic materials. As I said before, it's good for microwaves, 
but not for photonics. This is, these are ideas that have to do with B anisotropic uh, metamaterials that includes metals, which means that loss, which means that they are good mostly for microwaves also. This is what we did. This is what Hafezi did, and I'll say a few words about that. These, are, these two uh, are very interesting. This one, he is an interface between two honeycomb lattices. It's called the who and who model, two Chinese people that are, uh, one of them is professor, the other one was a PhD student in Japan. They don't live in China, they live in Japan. And this is uh, my scientific grandson, Inton Chong, that was a student of Marin Solacic, proposed another very novel system also. So this, all the, everything that is now today in topological photon, photonic topological insulators is related to one of these, more or less. So once we did this, um, uh, we asked, what is the next step? So the next step is very simple. We, you know, until that point, and in the three, four, five years after that, people, what they wanted to do is to take ideas from condensed matter physics and find ideas such that they cannot be realized in electronic systems. So let's do it with optics and we can learn from the experiment. This is nice, but one can ask why you do that. Well, you know, in 2013, we made the first photonic topological insulator and we can say that we actually, we knew the outcome in advance. We knew because we calculated it numerically, not only tight binding, but actually full wave simulations, full Maxwell. So why we want to waste time and study, uh, do the experiments? Why not study just numerically or analytically? Uh, why we, do we do such experiments at all? These are like demonstration experiments. This brings me to an argument that I had with my good friend, Michael Berry from the Berry phase of uh, argument of 15 years. And, in two, and he said, why you want to do this? These are not experiments meant for discovery. It's demonstration experiments. And in 2012, I won the argument, not because of me, but because at that year, Serge Jarosch won the Nobel Prize in Physics on cavity quantum electrodynamics on something that one can solve analytically. So when he started the experiment, he knew already that there is a solution. So why? The answer is that because physics is an experimental science and experiments lead to new ideas and many times offer new surprises. There's a whole philosophical lecture on this which I will not lecture today. I'll just give you an example of two of uh, one of work that we did on topological insulator lasers. And this was published in science in two papers, one theory, one experiments in 2018, back to back. And there today they became highly cited. So the idea is like this. The idea is to use the concepts of topological uh, insulators as a pathway to force many semiconductor lasers, emitters to operate together and lock together and operate as a single strong, powerful laser, highly coherent, high power laser. That was the idea, okay? The team that worked on that is part of the team that I mentioned earlier. And we collaborated on this with Mercedes Kajabikan and Dimitri Stodolides in Creole in the US. And the later work that I'll show you at the end today on the Vixel with Sebastian Klemp and Sven Hoffling from the University of Pittsburgh, Germany, okay? So when I started this idea, uh, I, I knew that we are going to actually face major obstacles. Now, why is that? Because everything that has to do with topological insulators in the theory of topological insulators has to do with emission systems. Why is that? Because the emission systems have conservation laws, conservation of energy, conservation of momentum, of angular momentum, and charge uh, conservation, but also conservation of the winding number, of this churn number. But if you have a non-emission system, which means that you can have gain and loss, Nothing in principle is conserved. Certainly energy is not conserved. So why the winding number should be conserved? So for many years, the people, the theorists in topological physics believed that there are no non-emission topological insulators whatsoever. Today, part of this was resolved because of our work. Not fully, there are still arguments, okay? The other system is that a laser, it's a system that has gain and loss. Obviously it's non-emission, this is why this one, this came out, and uh, but think about it. It's also a system that uh, that some a little bit of emission or scattering can be amplified. So just imagine that this topological insulator is not perfect, and there's a little bit of back scattering or scattering to the bulk. If you have gain in the system, this can be amplified. So this, in principle, topological lasers like this should not work. And the third reason is a topological insulator lasers are. Uh, uh, like any laser, have to be nonlinear. Every laser has to have gain saturation. So, and until then, at that time, 2014, 15, when we started this project, uh, the, all the 
topological insulators known were all linear. So at that time, but I, I did see applications. One of them that maybe you can have lasers with defects, rough edges, and the, but the biggest one was really the pathway to high power semiconductor laser arrays operating together as one efficient, highly coherent laser source. I proposed this the first time in Clio in 2016. And as you see, this was many years before anybody started to think about topological lasers of any kind. So because I knew that we will face a big argument, let's call it a big uh, conflict or war with our friends, uh, the theorists in condensed metaphysics that will not believe us. Then what we did, we took the, the archetypical model, the most important model in topological physics, which is the Aldane model. And what we did, we designed an Aldane system like this, theoretically, where it, uh, that looks like a honeycomb with nearest neighbor coupling and next nearest neighbor coupling. And we put a little laser on, on a little ring laser on each one of the vertices on each junction. And we looked at the properties and we made very nice predictions. Now here, the topology of the system is determined by the phase between the nearest neighbor, next to nearest neighbor coupling. There is ordinary nearest neighbor coupling like between waveguides, directional couplers, but also next nearest neighbor and this one has phase. So if the phase is, is zero, then what you get is this and it's not topological, it's trivial. How do you see? There's no band gap, so there's no topological band gap. And the edge states, the one that goes from left to right and the one that goes back are on the same curve. But if the phase here is not zero and not pi, then you open a band gap. And for pi over two, the band gap is the largest. And what you have is topological edge states. This one goes to the right, this one goes to the left. And so this one is suitable for a finite material for the top edge, and this one's for the bottom edge, and the edge states will go around and around. And we did the theory on this, which I will not show today because I have only 25 minutes. The major uh, findings were that we'll have uh, the topological features will force injection locking for all the, all the resonators, all the lasers. The laser, the topological laser is much more efficient. It favors single mode lasing, so it will be highly coherent and it is robust to imperfections. And now let me show you some experiments. And these are the experiments that were done on the platform of a uh, wavelength of uh, indium uh, indium gallium arsenide phosphide platform meant for to laser at, at telecommunication wavelength. And what you see here is the design, okay? And, and this is how it looks when you magnify it. The lasers are micro lasers coupled to some couplers, okay? So this is the idea. The idea is imagine that you have two lasers, two both of them are ring resonators. What you want now is to have two channels of coupling, upper channel, lower channel, and the path between them is not the same optical path. In other words, this one is shorter than this one. As a result of that, you have two fee phase difference, okay? How do we do it in practice? The coupler looks like an ellipse. And we, when the ellipse is centered exactly on the equator, then up and down have the same length and it's not topological. But when we shift the ellipse a little bit up or a little bit down, now you have something that have, has a phase difference because the optical path is different. So now let's take this and put it on a line. And here is the optical path difference of two phi and then three phi, four phi and so forth. So now when you go around, when you go on any loop here, you'll see that you will be left with a loop and with a phase shift on the loop. And this is equivalent to or similar to having a gauge field of as if a DC magnetic field is acting on the light, okay? So based on that, we created the first, uh, the first experiments and this was presented in uh, 2017, and what you can see here is comparison between topological laser that lays only on the margins and the trivial laser lays also inside and the efficiency was four times larger. This is nice, but was not good enough for publication. So a month later, Mercedes, our collaborator, created defects. And what you can see here is how in the topological one, the light here was shining much more bright than this for the same pumping. And that showed really that we, the laser is much more efficient. Not only that, the light seemed to be able to bypass the defects. So we, for that, to see that, we looked at the spectrum and you can see that the topological laser here had just very nice one line for low pumping or high pumping, whereas the trivial one had many lines. This was still not good enough to my taste for publication. So we worked another several months and now we made an array like this that with two output couplers. And the idea is that if you excite only this part and if the light really has to travel on the edge, then we will know, excite only this one and let's see what comes out from the output couplers. 
So what we saw is that when the system was topological and we excited only this, in other words, we pumped only this part, the light was able to go around and around and came out here. And this is the black line. And you can see that it's a very nice and efficient laser. But when it's not topological, when the ellipse of the couplers is centered and we excited this, nothing came out because when you don't pump it, it's absorbing. These are resonant materials, okay? So we pumped all four sides and now we got this. So now really we've shown the advantage of the topological laser, but uh, the next question is what will happen to the topological laser if you pump all four sides? Remember this plot? This plot is this. So when we pump all four sides, we get an, about another order of magnitude, at least of increase of efficiency. And this was now re looked reasonable. Still, I wanted to look at the spectrum. So this is the spectrum that we collected from scattering. And we wanted to see what is the spectrum everywhere in the in our array. The array was 10 by 10 lasers, 100 lasers, okay? So 40 of them were really on the edge. And we wanted to see the spectrum and compare to the output. So what you can see here is that the topological insulator laser lays at 1548 nanometers, all of them in the same line, whereas the trivial laser sometimes you get here, sometimes here. But this was very nice. And this is, shows unidirectionality, which I will skip now. This was very nice. And this was the situation that we had in 2018, with that we went to science and it got published and it's nice. And the next idea was, okay, uh, this is very nice, but still, we, if we want to pass high power, and the light here is circulating inside the layer on the chip, and we would like the light actually to be able to come out naturally, not to a couple to output port or anything. We'd like the light to shine at us. How do you do that? So the way to do that is to use pixels. Let me skip this. And we, this is really recent work that not published yet, when we wanted to look at a collection of pixels. Now, what is pixel? It's a vertical cavity surface emitting laser. So, so we now we constructed pillars of this sort, okay? And put them, uh, created an interface like this, a topological interface, and we saw what happens. So this is what happens. So we have now 30 lasers, little lasers like this. They are sitting on a topological interface. The topology is different in here and outside, and this is how the intensity looks like. The next thing that we did after that is we wanted to look at interference. So we reflected the field from a mirror and we folded it, the left on the right, and we interfered this laser with this laser, this laser with this laser. And what we got here is very nice interference pattern. So you can, what you can see here is the, actually the interference pattern that shows you that every laser on this array is coherent with all the others. Now, the vision here is to continue with this and to have thousands of vertical cavity lasers lasing collectively, phase-locked, and a single high-power, highly coherent source, laser source. And, and also, maybe also uh, emit pulses, mode pulses. In the last few years, we went into some different directions of topological insulators. Try to, to summarize, if possible. Yeah, yeah, I will summarize in a, in a moment, in a minute. Okay, so these are like a sample of three papers that we had recently. This is one that shows you how we can increase the dimensionality. This is a topological insulator of one of the dimensions is real space. The other one is modal dimension. And we, uh, we show the first photonic topological insulator in synthetic dimensions. Okay, another one that is interesting is we looked at what happens to a system that is topologically trivial and then you put disorder and the disorder transforms it into becoming topological insulator. Both of these papers were published in Nature. And this is another one. This is the exciton to polariton topological insulator. And what is interesting here is that the topological insulator here is part light, part matter. Okay. Some recent ideas that are really worthwhile looking into, and we are working on that and several others. What happens to topological protection of quantum states? We had the first theory paper on this proposing that this will happen. The, the, and then people started to experiments. We had an experimental paper on that in science uh, in nanophotonics. There was a paper that is related, not, uh, not exactly this by Muhammad Hafezi. And the idea is to show the topology protects entangled states. Okay, it's not fully shown yet. It's only partially shown. Even in our science paper, we showed part of it. Okay, there are still major questions on what happens to the topological invariance of the theory in non-emission systems. Some people claim that in two dimensions, non-emission, there is no topological insulators. In my opinion, we are, they are wrong. There are many, many other uh, interesting ideas. I will stop here and I'll tell you that what I'm using, I'm using photonics 
as a platform to explore ideas, new ideas in physics, and uh, that have impact not only in photonics, but also beyond it. And some of them actually lead sometimes to new technologies like the topological insulator laser. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Moti, for the insightful talk. These were two questions. One of them, how do you implant the, the next nearest coupling in the Haladine model? You have only okay. a nearest coupling. Okay. So we use that. If you read that paper carefully, you'll see that we use that model as a toy model. And the reason that I used it is to be able to, to make sure that the theories in condensed matter really do not complain. And so I took their most famous model and I turned it into a laser. But in the same paper, we also looked at the photonic platform and we, we looked really at the photonic platform that we later on implemented experiments. So what you see is that in the photonic platform, there are some advantages and disadvantages. The improvement in the stop efficiency is not as large as uh, expected from if we could in photonics have a Dane model like this, okay? But it is still at least an order, sometimes two orders of magnitude larger, the efficiency. So that is important. And the issue of backscattering, this is the slide that I uh, removed. The idea to address that is to every resonator like this to have an S inside. So uh -huh. if you have an S inside the resonator, uh, then maybe I will show this, huh? If you, yeah, never mind. If you have an S, you break, because the system is nonlinear, you break also time reverse asymmetry and there's no backscattering. And what we saw is that the extinction ratio between one output port and the next is on the order of 50, which is very, very nice for something that is on chip by itself. Very nice. Okay. The other question? The other question is about uh, the categories of topological insulators. What is the difference between the Chong and the, and the Havzi model? Okay, so the, uh, the, the Edong Chong model uh, is interesting because it assumes strong coupling. All the other models assume that you have, you can think that the light is, is most of the time in the units and does not spend time at all. It's like weakly coupled. So you can use the usual couple mode theory. When they are strongly coupled, it's really part of the same system. So when you solve it, you cannot do the usual tricks of tight binding gear. You need to, to have a design that is much, I would say more sophisticated. And the implication is really that this can be a very good platform to make nano lasers. So you think about lasers that are very, very small, smaller than half wavelength, like there was done, it was done by several groups, uh, Noginov and then Shalayev and a, Xiang uh, Zhang, who is now the president of Hong Kong University and so forth, then you can reduce the size of the lasers. And if you want to make a topological platform like that, you can, you should use the Yidong Chong model, which allows for it. All the other models, it will, maybe every unit will be smaller than the wavelength, but altogether it will be much bigger than the wavelength. So thank you very much, Moti. Something happened to the, for me, I, I cannot hear you the last word. So I wanted to ask you about chiral phonons, if you can do the same thing with phonons, but, but let's go on. Because yeah, I, I can tell you that, yes, not, not only you can do so it, thanks, Andrea, just a moment, Alibaba did it. Uh, Andrea Alou, who we fondly call him Alou Baba, he did it, actually, and he did it with, with, uh, with sound waves in the last two years. And there are several other groups. Bailey, there's oh. a guy by the name of Bailey from Singapore also did it. There are several others. So it was done, yes following exactly these ideas with uh, with uh, sound waves, which means phonons. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. So with that, I will I will go forward, uh, Professor Ni. Um, hello, everyone. Um, uh, thank you very much for uh, Israeli uh, scientists to uh, give the lecture first. And now it's the turn of our Chinese side. So let me uh, quickly introduce our next speaker. Uh, Professor Dai Qing. Uh, Professor Dai uh, received his PhD degree from University of Cambridge. And in 20, uh, 20, tw uh, 2012, he joined our center as a professor and assigned, an, uh, assigned as assistant director of NST since uh, 2019. Uh, his current research includes fabrication, electronic, uh, optic electronic properties of new uh, low dimensional carbon nanomaterials such as uh, carbon nanotubes and graphene. And Professor Dai received many awards and 
I won't want to spend a lot of time on that. Um, I will give the time for him to introduce his recent work. Uh, uh, Professor Dai, uh, please. Okay. Uh, hello, everyone. Thank you for the Professor Wang Jun's introduction. And also, I'm very appreciated for this opportunity uh, provided by Israel Academic. Okay, it's uh, really a pleasure uh, to meet so many uh, nano experts in this meeting from Israel. Uh, as you all know, my name is Ching Dai from National Center for Nano Science and Technology. Today, I would like to introduce our recent work on graphene plasma, which is used for surface enhanced infrared spectroscopy. Okay, uh, before I start uh, the introduction about itself, uh, before I start the introduction, I would like to give a brief uh, shortcut for the research interest of my lab. Uh, my research interest focused on nanophotonics, especially on plasmonics, near field optics, and also uh, ultra fast field emission. Uh, and for today, I will uh, explain, uh, spend most of my time on the plasmonic part. And this is the outline for my talk. Uh, I will start with the CIRA. Okay, generally speaking, infrared spectroscopy is a way to fast and, and non destructive detect of molecule vibrations. With the information of the fingerprint region, it will be able to identify the chemical composition and the structures of materials. Uh, however, when things go, uh, however, when things change dramatically, uh, if we went into the nano world, the mismatch uh, of the molecule of the infrared light and the molecule size are huge. Therefore, the infrared absorption of nanoscale molecules are too weak to be detected by our existing instruments. Therefore, the surface plasma become uh, a promising candidate to enhance infrared spectra of nanoscale materials. Okay. And uh, 2D uh, materials, Host a full suit of different polaritonic or polar, polaritonic modes with the highest degree of confinement among all known materials. The surface plasma polariton supported by electron in graphene constitute a most studied prominent example. Okay. Uh, excuse me, uh, Dazing, uh, can you please uh, share your screen with us? Okay, it hasn't shared my screen. Okay, just a second. How about now? Uh, yes, uh, but it's not PPT. Just a second. It's a screen. Uh, it's a screen of your computer, I guess. Okay, this is yeah. Here we go. Okay, sorry about that. I didn't recognize. That. So surface plasma is defined as an electron oscillation ignited by the incident light. It has a unique property including high local field enhancement and overcome diffraction limit. This figure demonstrates two types of plasma. One is called surface plasma polarator, as the electrical magnetic wave travel along the surface. The other one is called the local, uh, localized surface plasma, which is the result of the confinement of the surface plasma in a nanoparticle. And the electrical field near the particle surface are greatly enhanced. The plasma has been widely used for Raman signal enhancement, as we all know. Compared to SIRS, CIRA, which is short for surface enhanced infrared absorption, uh, <clears throat> needs the plasma resonance in the infrared range. Previous work has realized by using the metal nanostructure, but the performance is heavily limited by the efficiency and the working range of plasma. So new materials are desired for CIRA. And here is a diagram. We can see the supported surface plasma is mainly determined by three materials property, carrier density, mobility, and the intraband loss. Uh, 
Compared with all the other materials, uh, graphene have demonstrated great potential for CRI use since it has intrinsic infrared response with electrical tunability as well as high confinement because, because of its unique energy dispersion. Okay. Uh, a series of work have been reported to use graphene plasma for the theory application. Okay. Uh, for example, in 2015, the Hattis group detected the MI, uh, MI1 and MI2 modes for the monolayer protein. We are tuning the resonance frequency of graphene plasma. And in 2019, uh, CNS group used graphene acoustic plasma to successfully detect the vibrational mode of the sub monolayer protein. But, however, the more important infrared finger fingerprint region is still not reachable because there is a strong coupling effect between the graphene plasma and the substrate formal in this region. And moreover, only a single vibrational mode was enhanced, which is not enough for the molecule identification. So why graphene plasma cannot enhance the wide range infrared? This is because the graphene behavior are very sensitive to its dielectrical environment. As we can see from this figure, almost all the graphene atoms are exposed to the surface. So there are three key effects we need to consider for the enhancement with graphene plasma. Okay, they are implanted uh, according to the above three requirements during the past few years. We have symmetrically investigated how the dielectric environment affects the graphene plasma, include the gate gating design, uh, substrate selection, and also the in-plane graphene ribbons morphology. So, uh, based on these studies, a complete picture is built up, and we found an optimized graphene structure can be used for CIRA. Okay. And this substrate setup is now is showing in the left figure. By inserting a CAF2 layer between silicon substrate and the graphene nano ribbon, we can screen all the phonon coupling and realize the in situ gate tunable plasma to cover the whole fingerprint range as shown in the right figure. Okay, this is also the first time we observe, experimentally observe the intrinsic graphene plasma uh, in the carbon environment. Okay, after we get this uh, CIRA in, uh, get, get this CIRA enhancement devices, we try apply it in different phase for molecules recognition. Uh, but in, in the meanwhile, we also try to optimize our device for getting stronger signal. And we use this sense to detect a monolayer PO field. It's about eight nanometer thick. And the dark line in the left figure here, okay, in left figure, is the spectrum taken by traditional infrared spectroscopy. And the most of the vibrational mode are missing, okay. In contrast, the red line is the infrared spectrum with graphene plasma enhancement. Okay, and all these 14 peaks in the fingerprint region can be identified clearly. And the average enhancement of the signal approached over 20 times. So this is the 14 modes we are taken from the vocal materials and we can find them perfectly matched to the uh, nano seq PEO molecules membranes in this infrared enhancement spectrum. And to further analyze the enhancement effect, we can also find the closer the vibration mode to the graphene plasma resonance peak, the higher enhancement it will be. Okay, so this can be used to further increase the precision of the uh, <clears throat> precision or resolution of the infrared spectrum. Uh, it can be illustrated here by tuning the gate voltage, okay, we 
we can easily recognize the vibrational modes, which are very close to each other, such as the mode E and F in the right figure here. Okay, so by tuning the resonance peak, those two modes can be recognized precisely, since they will be enhanced separately, uh, and and then we can uh, accurately recognize whether it has a a resonant mode here. Okay, so it will be very useful for all truth detection, which will be talked shortly. But another point we want to emphasize is, is that with the graphene plasma enhancement, uh, both the out of plane and the in plane vibrational modes in the burn nitride can be clearly detected. And uh, as you can see here, for the uh, standard monolayer burn nitride, we cannot find detect the out of plane form of mode. But if we coupling or if we enhanced with graphene plasma, we can see a clearly a deep, deep here, which is absorption of the TO mode from the monolayer burn nitride. And also we can see as we tuning the voltage, this deposition is kept the same with, which is another uh, direct evidence to show this is a phonomal from the other hybrid mode. Okay. And the possible explanation for this enhancement uh, is because the effective electrical potential on the burn nitride can interact with the graphene plasma according to the remote phonon scattering mechanism. Okay. So this, we have applied this CIRA function with the you know, uh, molecule recognition for solid phase. And the next step is we're trying to optimize our devices for uh, gas sensing. Okay. So why are we using gas sensing for with the CIRA? The motivation is because many techniques have been reported already for the gas identification. For example, by detecting the change of the resistor and the resonance peak, both can achieve very high sensitivity to single molecule level, but they cannot recognize what molecule is already actually detected. So uh, in summary, it's a high sensitivity, but without an, but without an identification. Okay. So according to the solid phase experience, we think graphene plasma may realize this function, uh, which means we can uh, detect a very sensitive, very rare uh, gas molecules, but also we can find out what kind of uh, structure it is. Okay, so, but before we try this experiment, first step we need to consider how the gas absorption by the graphene ribbon. Since the gas molecule density is much smaller in the chamber rather than the membrane, the solid phase membranes. By calculating uh, the optical force, electron, electron static force, and also the physical absorption, we found the surface absorption okay, here is a dominant mechanism in trapping free gas molecules on graphene. Okay. And the, this is because the defect of nanoribbon H provides sufficient active sites for the gas molecule trapping. And moreover, the age is also the hot spot of the graphene plasma, which me means a high field enhancement. So by following this thought, we optimize the filling factor of graphene nanoribbon uh, array to realize the gas identification with the PPM scale sensitivity. Okay, PPM. So these pictures demonstrate the graphene plasma can be used to identify the all truths. With plasma enhanced <clears throat> infrared spectrum, we can clearly identify these nitrogen oxide gases from their rotational vibrational fingerprint peaks, respectively. Okay, from those three uh, diagrams, we can see they have different uh, infrared absorption. Okay, moreover, this gas can also be distinguished in mixture, which inspire us for the next experiment which is used for the monitoring chemical reaction okay 
First, the chamber was uh, filled with nitrogen oxide gas, which was clearly, clearly identifiable. Then the oxygen, uh, then the oxygen was injected into the chamber. The signal intensity of nitrogen uh, nitri ox oxygen nitride decreased to sixty percent, while a new pair peak appear uh, appeared. These new peaks, which coincide with the rotational vibrational modes of an O2. So this study may lead to the semi-quantitative of characterization with a time resolution for the chemical reaction. So after the investigative graphing plasma serial application in both solid phase and a gas phase, we are invited to write a review paper with uh, Professor Fondam Everest about the recent progress on nanomaterials for serial application. Uh, and the more and more uh, new materials demonstrated their potential in serial with a various frequency matching and enhancement. Okay. So as we already seen, we try to apply the serial devices in different phase for molecule recognition, but to increase the sensitivity to signal molecule level, we have to further optimize our devices to get in stronger signal, okay? And also, if we want to do the uh, liquid phase infrared characterization, we still have a few challenges to overcome. So, <clears throat> so generally speaking, the infrared signal of nanomaterials is weak due to the weak light and matter interaction. So, as the first way we saw, plasma, graphene plasma have very high signal enhancement more than times. 20 times, but it's still much lower than the theoretical value, which is difficult to meet the high precision molecule detection, such as a single molecule level detection. So this is mainly due to the low absorption strength and the weak light confinement effect of polarito. Therefore, we propose method to optimize the performance of polarito, designing the plasma in perfect absorption structure and exploring a new type of ultra confined polarity. Okay. So these are two approaches. First one is use the perfect absorption structure. Another way maybe we can explore, explore a new type of ultra confined polarity. So the first way we try is to design structures to, mean to do the perfect absorption. One possible solution is to use the gold mirror at the back of the devices, and the light can be reflected by the gold film and then uh, interact with graphene for the second or several times. Therefore, the absorption can be enhanced more than an order in the magnitude when the dielectric thickness is the proper. Okay. Uh, in addition to the structure design, we also explored a new type of ultra confined polarism that can be used for CIRA. In theoretical, uh, theoretical prediction, the thinner burn nitride has a higher confined polarism, phonon polarism, and the monolayer burn nitride has ultra confined polarism, but is uh, difficult to achieve momentum matching and uh, cannot be easily excited in uh, snow, okay, because there's a big uh, momentum mismatch. Oops. Okay, so here we explore that the electro excitation method can be a uh, alternative way to provide uh, ultra high spatial resolution and ultra high momentum. And because of it has uh, ultra short wavelengths of the electrons, so we can use uh, EOS, uh, high resolution EOS, to characterize these ultra fine co confined polarities to make sure it has a theoretical confinement property. Uh, so this is uh, uh, basically what we do. We use the monochromatic electron energy loss spectroscopy, and the minimum energy resolution is 7.5 millimeter MeV in a scanning transmission electron microscope to measure the phonon polaritons in monolayer burn nitride. And the phonon polaritons is exhibit high confinement 
is over 4, uh, 487 times, which can greatly improve, improve the efficiency of the serum. So in summary, we have uh, realized the undisturbed graphene plasma on infrared transparent substrate, which demonstrates great potential for fingerprint serum application in both gas and the solid phase. And for the future work, we are carrying on working uh, how to optimize the devices and you find the proper structure, uh, make it can be workable in liquid phase. And here I also want to take this opportunity to thank all my team and the collaborators here from uh, uh, Professor Zhipei Sun from Auto University, Jiang Ningchen from IOP, and uh, Jai Feng, Kai Hui, uh, Tony, and the founder, and Javier and Feng from all these international famous institutions. Okay. So, moreover, I also would like to take this opportunity to recommend a high impact peer review journal to uh, the, all the <coughs> attenders, uh, which is good for publishing both experiment and theoretical work in nanoscience and nanotechnology. Uh, it's uh, nanoscale. Okay, this journal is published more than 2,000 paper uh, a year and have kept this impact factor around seven for the last three years, which is considering high impact factor according to such high volume. And this journal is uh, uh, co-organized by ISC and the Nano Science Center from our institution. Okay. So if we, if everyone is interested, please feel free to contact them. Okay. So All thank right. you uh, for so the attention. Okay. Any thank you, uh, Chen. Thank you. Uh, we have uh, uh, seven minutes for discussion. So please, any audience have uh, questions for Dai Qing, please. Uh, we have the question from the audience or the guests. No, there is no question uh, that were written by now. So, if somebody has a question, please write it down in Q and A. All right. Okay. So then, uh, so Professor Dajing saved a few minutes for us. So we'll keep going. Yeah. So that's all for my talk. So I think so far there's no questions for you, Dai Qing. So probably we'll ask people to write down their questions. Uh, okay. We have a, a Q&A session after the all talks, I guess. Yeah. Okay, okay. That's all, thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So thank you very much for the very nice talk. Ah, there is a question, I think. Oh, there is a question. Uh, I, okay. didn't, I didn't succeed to understand how to improve the device. Can you return on it, please? Can you tell how to improve the last device? So I think there is a question for you. Yeah, let me share the screen. Uh, share the screen. Uh, you mean how to improve the structures, improve the device performance by the structures? Yael, maybe you can ask in person. Okay. So, as we all can see here, actually for the solid phase and the gas phase detection, I think the structure is quite perfect. It can uh, detect uh, the sub monolayer membranes, but for the in liquid detection, liquid phase detection, it will uh, have different challenge. Uh, first thing is have to make sure all the substrate are waterproof it won't be you know, uh, deteriorated by the water in the liquid phase. So that's the one obstacle we need to work on. Uh, <clears throat> also, we have to increase the strength of the uh, infrared uh, absorption because the water molecule itself will absorb a lot of uh, uh, signal strength. So that's why we introduced the perfect absorption uh, structure at the back of the substrate. We try and, uh, it, it kind of like uh, the phenolic crystal or the metal surface structure, which is uh, using a mirror reflect 
the incident light between the substrate and the back uh, backside. So which make more times it can be interact with graphene ribbon. So in that way, we can increase the signal absorption. Okay, that's uh, the way for the device structure. But why can't you passivate the, the device? Just put oxide or something because plasmonic is not the, an interface effect. A, you can put very thin oxide on the device and use it in solution. Uh, can you repeat your question? We are up to I the put device. a very thin particulate layer right. on top of the device and then okay. use liquid. Uh, as I said, if you put it on top of the graphene, it will make the graphene plasma interact with the surface phonon of the oxide membranes, and we will deteriorate the surface uh, plasma uh, enhancement itself. That's why we try to use the CAF2 as an insulate layer between the silicon dioxide substrate. Uh, we're using the CAF2 layer to between the silicon substrate and the graphene ribbon to make sure it can screen all the phonal uh, coupling from the substrate. Okay. Any more questions? So thank you very much for the very nice talk. Okay. Uh, there is another one, I think Sorry. from the audience. Yeah, Sorry. there's a new one coming. Sorry. Uh, can other material, there is another additional questions. Uh, okay, okay so, materials can be instead of graphene plasma. That's a good question. That's why we uh, now uh, also uh, investigated on the, from the burn nitride. Okay, we try, as we mentioned here before, uh, there are several polaritons in 2D families, okay? Into like a plasma polariton, phono polariton, like cyton polaritons, and extra and so on. And plasma has a high confinement, but a phono polariton because it's oscillate between the, uh, the, the, the atom structure. So it has a longer life than the plasma electron oscillation. And also it has ultra high confinement than the electron confinement. So that's why we are using EOS in the, the one page we mentioned. That's why we using the EOS to characterize the phonon polariton on the monolayer uh, burn nitride. We're just trying to find a better polariton, which can be more, uh, which can be more effective for the a pseudo confinement and then can increase the limit of the uh, uh, enhancement. Okay, so yes, the, the, the direct answer yes is, is yes, uh, except from graphene, we can also try other 2D materials like the nitride uh, and also as well as uh, MOS2 for the uh, exciting polaritons. Yes. Great. Coming up, yeah, we keep moving. Yeah. Professor. Thank you. Uh, a very nice talk, and, uh, and we'll go on. I want to introduce next is Professor Tal Ellenbogen from uh, the Israeli side this time, and he's from the, the head of the Nanoscale Electro Optics Lab in Tel Aviv University. He also received several awards, uh, SPAE, Intel, and Applied Three Materials Award, and he will talk about uh, functional terahertz emitter based on non-linear metasurfaces. So Tal, please. Okay, uh, so uh, do you hear me? Yeah, very good. Okay, thank you. So uh, thank you, Yossi, uh, for the introduction and uh, it's a great pleasure me, for me to uh, present here and uh, I would like to thank the organizers for inviting me to do it. It's uh, especially exciting because uh, in the second part of the talk, uh, I will present uh, results of a very close collaboration that we have uh, with the Chinese group of uh, Professor Gu Xin Li from the Southern University of uh, Science and Technology. And this is actually the first uh, time that I uh, present uh, this uh, result. So uh, we are talking about uh, the ability to create functional terahertz emitters from uh, non-linear metasurfaces. Uh, for those of you who are not uh, familiar with the concept of uh, metasurfaces, 
These are engineered surfaces, uh, very, very thin, uh, with the artificial uh, macroscopic uh, optical properties. Uh, the way we construct them is uh, we take uh, inclusions, uh, in the optical domain these are uh, usually nano-inclusions, uh, that are made either from uh, plasmonic uh, resonators or uh, high-index uh, dielectrics, and uh, if we can uh, understand and tailor the interaction of the uh, light with the single resonator and also understand the collective interaction on the metasurface, the idea is that we can mimic and uh, basically tailor uh, macroscopic uh, optical uh, properties, especially on the surface and achieve a functionality from uh, these uh, surfaces. And these were used in recent years in many uh, demonstrations of uh, flat uh, optical elements that are now already uh, being uh, deployed in uh, industrial uh, technological uses. What is the relation to terahertz? Uh, the relation comes from the fact that it was shown in recent years that if you take a metallic, a plasmonic a metasurface and uh, shine it with the femtosecond light source, you get a burst of a single cycle uh, terahertz emission. This is a single cycle, so it's a uh, very, very broadband. And uh, several uh, mechanisms were uh, discussed as uh, uh, the origin of this emission. For example, uh, photo emission of electrons and the acceleration on the field gradients uh, was discussed in, uh, as one mechanism. And in the field of these uh, so called uh, split ring uh, resonators, a quadratic uh, optical rectification uh, was uh, suggested as the mechanism. And uh, in this case, you can see very strong uh, third single cycle uh, is uh, uh, emitted when you shine on the resonance of the split ring resonators. And uh, what they did in this work is they compared the emission from a 40 nanometer thick uh, split ring resonator and a 200 micrometer thick 0.2 millimeter of zinc telluride, which is a sort of a state of the art uh, nonlinear crystal for, a, for a, a generation of the terahertz, they got a comparable emission. So, this is uh, something that uh, worth uh, attention, maybe into development to some kind of a uh, new technology for the terahertz. And uh, why is it important? Uh, because uh, the terahertz regime is the regime of uh, frequencies that is exactly between the uh, radio frequency regime and the uh, optical regime. And it turns out that uh, the technologies that we have to control electromagnetic waves in the radio frequency regime or the optical regime don't uh, work well for these uh, uh, frequencies, uh, which uh, leaves us with uh, insufficient uh, sources for generation, for detection, and uh, manipulation. And uh, this is important because we have uh, emerging important applications in uh, various fields, for example, in the uh, material science, physics, uh, biomedicine, security, communication, and more. Uh, so it is uh, interesting to find new technologies that uh, may uh, uh, allow us to achieve new functionalities or uh, can be more efficient. So uh, we wanted to uh, look into that. So we constructed the uh, terex generation and detection setup. I will briefly go through uh, this uh, setup. Uh, we have a femtosecond uh, light source that excites the metasurface. Uh, this is the metasurface that we uh, originally did. This is gold uh, split ring uh, resonators on the uh, top of glass. And then uh, the terahertz emission is uh, collected here and collimated and sent to a part of detection using uh, electro-optic uh, detection method. I will not elaborate on that. I will just say that by changing, uh, taking a probe pulse and uh, sweeping temporally over the terahertz pulse, we can uh, actually measure the field of the terahertz. One last thing that we have here in this system is that we add here in the collimated space, we add a slit or a hole that we can raster scan uh, the shape of the wave packet that is emitted here and understand how it looks. So uh, when we do this uh, experiment for a uh, one millimeter by one millimeter split ring uniform sample of uh, split ring resonators, this is the experimental measurement of the wave packet. This is the transverse direction in the collimated space and this is the uh, propagation, so this is time. And you see that we indeed we get this single cycle, a wave packet with single cycle oscillation in time, 
in a sort of uh, like a Gaussian like a transverse uh, profile. You can also uh, look at the frequencies, the content, terrace frequencies content for each uh, line here. And uh, you see this uh, picture, which looks like a diffraction from a slit, low uh, frequencies uh, diffract uh, more than high, which is reasonable because this is one millimeter by one millimeter. It's uh, uh, very close to the wavelength. The wavelength at one terahertz is uh, 300 micrometers. So you should expect this uh, strong uh, diffraction. So now comes uh, the idea of what we can do with that. This uh, meta surface is built of many, many, many tiny uh, nano resonators or tiny elements that uh, are in charge of emitting this uh, terahertz. And we can control each and every uh, tiny element here on the surface. Uh, and uh, by that, maybe we can actually have a spatial and amplitude the phase control on the emitted uh, terahertz uh, properties. So we can tailor the spatial temporal properties of emitted terahertz and maybe develop a, a new family of uh, these uh, functional terahertz emitter. And uh, we use this concept uh, uh, to show many uh, examples. I will just uh, go uh, quickly on these examples because I want to go to the collaboration part. So the uh, first thing that we did was simply to invert the split ring uh, resonators on one side with respect uh, to the other. So uh, this uh, was expected because it's uh, related to quadratic nonlinearity. We uh, invert the symmetry. It was expected that we get a pi uh, phase shift on the emitted uh, terahertz. And here uh, is the measurement. And uh, indeed, uh, what you see here is that instead of this uh, Gaussian, zero, zero uh, Gaussian mode, in this case, we get a single cycle emit Gaussian uh, zero mode. You see uh, how it uh, flips uh, the phase. So uh, we were very happy to see that uh, this concept uh, actually works. But in this case, it's even more exciting because of several uh, features. First of all, because it's a single cycle. So you see that it is single cycle both in the propagation and also in the transverse case, you have some kind of a, a spatial temporal quadrupole, which is usually a localized mode, but here this is a propagating mode. And you have to generate it into this mode. You cannot, because it's so broadband and there are uh, big, big uh, challenges to control terahertz radiation, you have to generate it directly into this uh, uh, unique uh, mode. So our uh, new emitter or our new concept allows now to uh, generate and examine uh, electromagnetics of this uh, complex uh, single cycle uh, wave pattern. We also show that we can create an emitter of uh, based on a nonlinear photonic crystal. If we now create a periodic uh, modulation, then uh, the terahertz emission has to answer the momentum uh, matching condition with the lattice constant here, which sets each uh, frequency component to a different angle. So this emitter doesn't emit all the frequencies in the uh, in one direction, but it disperses, strongly disperses all the frequencies. So uh, maybe you can use it as a new type of a single shot uh, terahertz spectrometer. We also show that you can create actually focus the emission. Many times you want to focus in the, in the terahertz domain to use another element to focus. If it's a transmissive element, it is problematic because you have reflections, you have a, absorption, so we could design an emitter that is based on a nonlinear uh, Fresnel zone plate uh, type of emitter with this pi phase uh, modulation, and we show that this emitter indeed, it, it this, uh, the experimental results, we can uh, generate this broadband terahertz uh, uh, radiation and focus each uh, frequency component to different location along the optical uh, axis. Uh, we also show that if you put this kind of emitter in the, uh, some kind of different uh, configurations, for example, in a parallel plate wavebed configuration, now the emission uh, that can uh, the emission that can efficiently emit is basically dictated by the local uh, photonic uh, modes of the system, which in a parallel plate wavebed these are uh, wavegate modes. So we saw that. Uh, we can emit to this uh, wavegate modes and the emission is uh, dependent on the symmetry of your uh, split ring uh, resonators. So this kind of arrangement 
we emit into a, a T mode, so this is much uh, now the, the broad emission that we get uh, usually. And uh, for uh, flipping the symmetry, now you can emit to the TM mode. And now you nicely can see how this TM0 uh, mode also arises, and you can control the location of the mode by uh, also changing the thickness of your plate. So we show that this concept is valid, and you can maybe develop a new technology for the TRX energy. But in all of our demonstration, we use a pi phase manipulation up and down, just the inverted symmetry. So this is useful, but what you would really like to have is they have a continuous control on the terrax emission process. And in the field of uh, metasurfaces, uh, the concept of geometric uh, pancharat number effect was used uh, a lot as a key concept to allow this uh, continuous uh, control over the phase of uh, light. So this concept was uh, discussed first by uh, Pancharatnam in uh, 1956, when he studied the general the polarization inter interference. Uh, you can look at it from different angles, but basically you can uh, understand this concept that if you have an initial and a final polarization state and a medium polarization state, uh, depending on this medium polarization state, if these are different medium polarization state will exert different phase on the final polarization state. And the, an analogy for that was uh, found by uh, Michael Berry uh, in 1987 in the case of slowly varying uh, quantum system. And he actually acknowledged that this is an analogy to the optical observation of, of Pancharatnam. And this is why it's called the Pancharatnam uh, Berry effect. And in the case of uh, metasurfaces, as I told you, it was uh, used uh, a lot. And here you can see a, a figure from one of the first uh, works that uh, was down around the year 2000. Uh, Professor Ernst Hassmann from the Technion uh, realized that you can use this uh, concept uh, to create uh, this uh, space varying Pancharatnam uh, Berry phase. And then if you can control the phase in space, you can create a flat optical uh, element. So here uh, it is made out of a uh, subwavelength gradient, but uh, these are actually metasurfaces. Uh, it's just the name metasurfaces was not coined uh, back then. So you can see here uh, in this figure on the Poincaré sphere, if you start with right hand circular polarization and go, let's say, through one linear uh, polarization state to left hand circular or to another rotated. A, a linear polarization state by an angle theta on your final left hand a circular polarization, you will get a, a two theta phase. And he used it to a, create a, in a, a series of work to create a, this space variant a, elements and control a, a, the radiation. It was later used also by many others. And uh, as I told you, it's a, a key concept in the field. In the nonlinear regime, uh, the first that showed it, as far as I know, are uh, Gushin Li, uh, my collaborator, when he worked with the uh, Xuan Zhang and uh, Thomas uh, Zengraf. So uh, the first uh, time, the, uh, the first demonstration was on the uh, third harmonic uh, generation. And you can see that they can uh, start with the excited sample with the RCP uh, polarization, and then they can invert the outcoming uh, polarization state, in this case only one uh, polarization output. In here you have uh, two different uh, angles for LCP and RCP, they showed it uh, experimentally. And uh, the reason for this uh, difference is because uh, in the nonlinear domain, when you connect between different circular polarization states, uh, in general, basically, you have a symmetry selection rules that you have to follow. Uh, not all symmetries allow you to uh, connect between a, a circular different circular polarization states. So uh, you have to apply them. And it depends on the harmonic order the number of interacting photons, the phase that you uh, accumulate, and the symmetry. So here you can see a very nice uh, table that is uh, summarizing these uh, selection rules. This is uh, taken from a beautiful uh, review by uh, Gu Xinli, Xuan Zhang, and Thomas uh, Zendraf. 
או אין ג'נרל או נונינר פוטונים ואת הסרפסט ואין ריזור סרפסקשן או פלצ'רת נאמברי ואת הסרפסט So you can see here that uh, first of all when you go to the nonlinear regime you can uh, amplify the geometric phase because you have more photons that are interacting uh, uh, so you can uh, get more than uh, just uh, two theta you can uh, uh, amplify with the uh, scaling with the number of, of interacting photons and then uh, different symmetries uh, basically uh, you select the processes that uh, are allowed. And uh, for a quadratic uh, non-linearity, uh, for the case of second harmonic generation, this uh, C3 uh, symmetry uh, was used because it's a very clean system. It uh, gives you this uh, three uh, theta sigma uh, geometric phase and you don't have uh, other processes, so you can uh, use it as a very clean system to control the second harmonic and uh, things uh, were uh, done in this uh, field. So uh, I uh, had the opportunity around uh, two years ago uh, to meet with uh, Kushin Lee in a conference in uh, Singapore and uh, show the results that we have in the terrace and uh, after the talk uh, he approached me and actually suggested uh, that we uh, study together if we can use this uh, geometrical phase concept to uh, control the emitted terrorists. And I was, of course, very uh, happy because I knew that this continuous control can take us uh, a long way. But if you look at the uh, terrorists uh, process, the terrorists process is not an up conversion process like second harmonic generation. If you are talking about optical uh, rectification, it's a down conversion process, which uh, actually uh, means that if you uh, look at the selection rules and they use pure circular and polarized states, LCP or RCP, the uh, terrorist is uh, forbidden. But there is a solution, and the solution is that what you have to do is use both. If you have both, a circular polarization states on, on your pump beam, then you can use, a, let's say, RCP minus LCP to create an LCP a terrorite photon with minus three theta phase, or LCP minus RCP to create an RCP terrorite photon with a plus a three sigma. So uh, this was the first, uh, we have two observations. First, the, the selection rules that a pure circular polarization state cannot create the terrorists out of uh, this symmetry. And second, that if we use both, which means actually using both, let's say you can use a linear a pump beam, then you will get your terrorists and your terrorists can uh, sustain a three theta uh, geometric phase on the opposite on the different polarization states. So uh, we set to make uh, the experiment. Uh, this is the uh, sample that we fabricated. It's called the uh, uh, C3 meta atoms on uh, glass. And you see that the first uh, thing was actually confirmed. When we uh, pump the uh, meta surface with circular polarization state, we uh, almost get nothing. It's at the noise level. And when we pump it with linear, suddenly we got a very, very strong uh, uh, single cycle terror, so we were uh, very happy. And they uh, went to check the second uh, property here of this three theta. So the fact that you have plus three theta on one uh, circular polarization state and minus three theta on the other circular polarization state means actually that these emitters emit a linear polarization state that is tilted by a uh, three theta with respect to your uh, pump. So how does it look? If you have a pump polarization and you tilt your uh, uh, C3 meta atom, then uh, what you should uh, observe is that your terrorist polarization has a three theta uh, to the uh, pump. So here you can see this experimental confirmation. Here you can see the uh, pump uh, terahertz and the, the pump and the emitted uh, terahertz, it's not uh, EY, it's uh, all the, the, the field. 
And uh, for the case of uh, pumping, pumping the meta-atom, the line here, uh, you can see that we get only EY uh, terahertz. If we pump at uh, minus 45 degrees, we get three theta, which means it's uh, plus 90, which means that we get uh, only X polarization. And if we uh, pump at uh, minus 90 degrees, we should have 270 degrees, which means uh, 180 degrees, which means minus Y. So this is first the complete verification that we can use the PB phase for the terahertz emission process. The, for the first time, this is uh, verified. And uh, actually, uh, it means that we can simply use this emitter also by electro-optical or all optical control of the pump polarization, we can control the terahertz polarization. So we have an emitter that we can easily control the terahertz polarization for a different application. But now we can also create a space variant uh, element and start to enjoy the fact that we can uh, design this uh, continuous uh, uh, phase and uh, look at what we can obtain from that. So first thing that we did was a, a simple uh, space uh, variant element. If you, if you vary the rotation of your uh, structure continuously on the element, it means that the LCP and excite them with the linear polarization, it means that the LCP and the RCP will experience opposite uh, phase, opposite gradient phase, which means that actually you separate the LCP and RCP in space. This is an emitter that can uh, create pure uh, circular, terrain, circular polarization state and separate them in uh, space. So we uh, went ahead to uh, do the experiment and uh, we measured the full uh, EX and the EY uh, measurement. And we actually confirmed the fact that on one order you have a pure LCP and on the other order you have a pure uh, RCP. Here, here you can see the, for a certain uh, location that was aligned uh, carefully, you can see uh, the first one order, uh, the difference between EX component and EY is plus pi over two, and for the minus one order, it's uh, uh, minus uh, pi over two. So uh, this is very nice and uh, maybe also applicative because now you can uh, maybe use this uh, pure circular uh, polarization state. So if you excite the, the emitter at an angle, we can uh, collect uh, all the emission of uh, one order. So this is what you see here, the uh, full emission of uh, the RCP order. And if you cut through uh, different angles or different locations in the collimated space, you see that the oscillations are uh, uh, with different periods which means that you actually, for different angles, you get emission of different frequencies, and this is continuous. So you have a pure circular polarization state on each order, and you have a, a frequency dispersion, continuous frequency dispersion, so you can use it for a spectroscopy, in particular for a circular dihoid spectroscopy. So here you can see uh, how we uh, used it. This is a demonstration. This is an enantiomer, a L15 enantiomer, and we measure the absorption in the LCP and RCP states. And in the, one of the absorption lines, you see how we got this is log scale, we got significant absorption on one state. And this is actually important maybe for a drug industry because we know that several drugs, they are beneficial in one chirality and can be poisonous in the other chirality. So maybe you can use it as a tool to identify if these drugs are uh, real or fake or preferred uh, proper. So uh, unrelated to that, in a different work we showed that if you look at the far field and have some kind of function of your meta, on your meta surface, uh, each location you emit a single cycle and you, if you look at the far field, you have different time of arrival to the far field, which actually in the parallel ray approximation, you can directly connect between the time and the space which means that you have direct, if you collimate it, you have direct space to time mapping. What you write here on space on the meta surface will be the function of the, your terahertz passing time. And you can actually calculate it and see that it's the convolution between the meta surface function and the kernel uh, pulse, the bandwidth of your uh, frequency. So we wanted to show that for this new uh, PB phase uh, emitter. 
or in a new uh, functionality. And what we decided to show is that because we have this perfect polarization control, we can create a pulse that uh, has only few cycles and we can arbitrarily change the polarization of each cycle. So we designed this uh, sample that has a rotation over two periods, one rotation over two periods, and we know that it, it will separate RCP and RCP to different angles. Then it's only up and down, so this should create a linear polarization for one cycle, and then another rotation on the other uh, direction will separate LCP and RCP, but to uh, the opposite angles, and if you look at the symmetry that you break twice, you pump this with the IR, uh, and you get this five cycle uh, Tera F wave packet, which starts with two cycles of radially polarized, then one cycle of linear, then two cycles of linear, uh, left and, uh, not radially, sorry, right and polarized, linear and left and polarized. So here you can see the simulation of what you expect in the uh, Y polarization and in the X polarization. So here you can see in the middle, one cycle is missing in the X polarization because this is uh, linear. And these are the experimental confirmation. So uh, we were uh, very happy. I think it's very cool that you can create only a few cycle a wave packet and control locally the polarization even on one cycle uh, and change between them. If someone in the audience has uh, an idea or something that we can do with that, please uh, contact me. So I would like to wrap up by acknowledging the team. Uh, here is uh, Professor uh, Bushin Li, our collaborator in his uh, visit uh, to Tel Aviv. Uh, this is the shoreline of uh, Tel Aviv. This is uh, Dr. Cormac McDonald, a postdoc from uh, my group who did all the experiments and is a co-first author on the paper with uh, Dr. Chan Hun Den from the Chinese part who did the design and uh, fabrication. And uh, Simo Sideris is a PhD in my group uh, that did simulations and uh, some fabrication. So all together we are uh, five researchers, four different nationalities, Israel, uh, China, Ireland, and Greece. Three is the rotational symmetry that we work with. We have uh, already two joint papers and one uh, pre-submission, and we have uh, one uh, pending uh, grant uh, proposal that was recently submitted to the ISF uh, NSFC. So if there are any uh, reviewers here in the audience, I hope that you are as excited as we are by the possibilities that we have here. We, I think that we only show the tip of the iceberg of what we can do with this PB phase uh, nonlinear terrace emitter. And I hope that you will be excited as we are and support this uh, uh, binational journey together. Thank you very much for attention. Well, thanks, Tal. It was a very nice talk. Uh, we have time for one or two questions. Did you think Tal uh, using a uh, chiral metamaterial as Moti shows the coupling could be stronger and then you break the symmetry between right and left chiral uh, uh, circular polarization? Uh, I don't know what you have uh, in mind, but uh, uh, basically we also break it with this uh, varying uh, PB phase. You get this. Uh, yeah, but, but then you will have it stronger, and you and you and you will break also right and left, and also as Moti shows, is the coupling, uh, the, the collective effect could be stronger. Uh, we didn't uh, look at uh, these ideas. There are actually also many ideas from uh, Eretz Hassman's uh, work on uh, rush by effects and uh, stuff like that, that can certainly be uh, studied in this uh, framework of uh, terrace emitter. Yeah, very nice. Okay, so thanks, Tal. It was very nice. I will have to cut you short since we, you are a little over time. So thanks for the very nice talk. And uh, so we'll go now for the last uh, talk of, uh, of this uh, session before we have the discussion. And uh, Professor Ni, please. Okay. Once again, uh, we thank the Israeli's uh, colleagues to give a very nice talk. Uh, our next speaker uh, is uh, Professor Xiao Sun Wu. Uh, I will give a very brief introduction about her. 
uh, research. Uh, Xiao Chun uh, got her PhD degree from Nankai University in 1995, and then she completed her postdoc training in Institute of Physics, Chinese Academy of Sciences, and then she continued her research on um, in Germany for seven years. And in 2005, she joined our center. Today, she will talk about the chiral plasmonics. Uh, uh, so please, Xiao Chun, it's your uh, time. Hello, can you hear me? Uh, yes, perfect. OK. Yeah. yeah. So uh, hello, everyone. <coughs> So good afternoon. Uh, <clears throat> can you see the the screen? Not yet. Not yet. You haven't shared your screen yet. You haven't shared your screen yet. Okay. Now right. it's okay. Yeah. yeah, it's okay. Yeah. But I can't see the the screen. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, hello, uh, good afternoon, everyone. So it's my pleasure to have this opportunity to attend this uh, bilateral online meeting uh, to know each other better. First, I will give a brief uh, introduction about research activities in my group. Xiaoshun, please show the whole screen of your uh, uh, talks. Uh, okay. It's okay now? No, it's it's the research activity in your uh, in your group. It's it's the first uh, uh yeah it's this first slide yeah. So now the screen is okay. Yeah, but it's not uh, in the uh, sewing mode, so we can't follow you. So you have to click uh, the the uh, to click the slides. Um, using the sold mode, display mode. No, it's not. So you now don't have you 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 hold PPT. Now it's not broadcast mode. You now just hold it and hold it. You 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 hold it. 再往左，再往左一点，这儿就在左边这儿，就是 display 那个，嗯，播放一下 PPT， 播放一下 PPT。不是全屏，是播放，用用播放模式。在下边右下角倒数第二行，那有一个小钮，这是这是你把你那个显示器放上。Sorry, I I I don't know. I think this is is okay. Okay, you can keep talking. Yeah. Okay, this is per perfect. Yeah. So now it's okay. Now you so uh, okay. Now it's okay. Yes, please go ahead. Yeah. Uh, so uh, sorry for this because I'm not familiar with this uh, outline. So first, I uh, give a short introduction about the research activity in my group. Uh, currently, uh, my group is mainly focused on the three uh, research field. It's related to rational design and the controlled synthesis of novel metal based nanostructure and the plasma enhanced properties and performance and uh, uh, their biological applications such as uh, biosensor, drug delivery and photosomal therapy, et cetera. All this is in collaboration with our colleagues in the Institute. And the third part is a. Uh, uh, technical standard systems for the plasmonic nanomaterials. <clears throat> uh, now I go to the talk of the today. The title of my talk is uh, Construction of Chiral Plasmonic Nanostructure and the Tuning Chiral 
optical properties. <coughs> I think uh, Professor Dai and also Professor <coughs> Ellen Bogen both gave very nice introduction about the uh, plasmonic structures. Uh, my talk includes the following three parts. First, I will give a, a brief background introduction about this field. Then in the second and the third part, I will present some research progress of my group in this field. <coughs> uh, in the second part, it's related to the dynamic carrier plasmonic superstructures. <coughs> uh, DCPSS, actually this kind of uh, DCPS are very promising <coughs> uh, metal materials uh, with uh, stimuli response is a stimulator responses. And also the third part is the discrete carrier plasmonic nanostructures, which can be obtained through the dipole plasma interaction or through the carrier growth. Due to the nice control of the carrier hotspot, uh, this kind of DCPNS material are very good for this like uh, a uh, local field enhanced uh, uh, spectroscopic analysis and also like a carrier catalysis. Uh, first, terrality uh, is ubiquitous. In nature, we have various, uh, uh, various uh, carrier architectures in nature from quite a small uh, chemical, uh, quite a small chemical molecules uh, like uh, amino acid <coughs> to the nanoscale uh, micromolecules like uh, DNA or the proteins to the uh, microorganisms like uh, uh, various bacteria and uh, virus also go to uh, microscopic large, uh, <coughs> large living systems uh, like typical this uh, snail structures. So along this uh, arrow line, we can see the uh, chirality actually become complicated from the individual chirality to the collectivity, uh, collective uh, chirality. Similar, uh, similarly, for the plasmonic nanoparticles, the chirality can be also developed stepwise, like from the nanocluster to plasmonic nanoparticle and to the three-dimensional um, superstructures. Um, and they have uh, potential applications in like uh, metal, metal materials, like uh, second harmonic generation, negative index of uh, refraction. Uh, previous Professor Alan Bogan actually gave excellent talk about metal surfaces. <laughs> so as I mentioned above, they can also be used like in the catalysis and the pharmacology, also the various steel chemical analysis. <laughs> uh, recently due to the uh, great progress in this uh, uh, carrier plasmonic field, actually they it injects new vitality to, to the old uh, chirality sense. Normal, uh, normally for the bottom up, uh, for the bottom up strategy, the chirality can be viewed based on two methods. Uh, one is through the One is through the dipole and uh, dipole plasma interaction between the carrier molecule and the plasma nanoparticles. This is called induced chirality. Uh, but often this kind of uh, chirality is quite small due to, due to the weak uh, interaction between the carrier dipole and the plasma. So often the local, local uh, field enhance 
is used to enhance the dipoplasma interaction. So to get a larger, to get the larger terraplasmonic uh, uh, properties. Uh, quite often, the the structure chirality actually is uh, is fabricated by using large carrier template to get the carrier assembly of non carrier particles such as uh, DNA, uh, protein, and uh, polypeptide. All this kind of carrier template they often give much larger carrier optical properties due to the structural chirality. And for, uh, in, for instance, such chiral assemblies can be used for the uh, disease detection. Uh, in, in, 2000, in 2018, uh, Professor Lismazan's group actually showed uh, by, the, uh, by the guide of uh, Amylo amyloid fibers, golden nanoparticle can form the chiral assembly. Based on the plasmonic chirality, they can be used for the Parkinson's disease detection. This shows how it can be detected. So the Parkinson affected patients have the large uh, circular uh, circular diagram response, even have, uh, have the large CD response, uh, but the healthy persons uh, give very low uh, background noise. Uh, also, the chiral nanoparticles can be uh, used for the uh, uh, disease treatment. Uh, this is one example from uh, uh, Professor Tang. Uh, he is a uh, he just gave a opening ceremony several uh, two hours ago. So his group used this carrier golden nanoparticle to treat the um, uh, Alzheimer's disease. They found uh, like uh, a D-glucosin carrier kind of golden nanoparticle have better uh, have better efficacy in rescue memory deficit in a mouse model of Alzheimer's disease. So now go back to the work of uh, my group. Uh, actually, in the in fabricating the kind of super molecule systems, surgeons and the soldier effects is a, a well known principle. But this principle has not been extended to the uh, fabrication of uh, plasmonic chiral superstructures. So we ask uh, ourselves, could uh, these effects can be used for the fabrication of uh, uh, chiral plasmonic superstructure and realize the cross length scale transmission of uh, molecular chirality to the superstructures. If this is possible, it's actually have a, a wide, uh, have a obvious advantage as we know we have wide availability of casual small molecules and the nanoparticle is easy to modification and uh, have the large tunability and it also has better controllability than the So the minimum chiral unit for the road shaped uh, assembly actually is a road dimer. It's just a, a, a side by side road dimer with a, a dehydro angle will give the minimum chiral unit. So we test our idea uses uh, uh, gold nano uh, gold nano road to see if in the non-chiral gold 
uh, SPS assemblies, if we add the terra molecules, they can they can give the terra signals. So uh, this uh, pictures actually the the golden monomers we use. This uh, part is the uh, the small oligomers formed by the electrostatic force. And this is a FDTD simulation. Uh, this simulation tell us even with a very small dehydro angle of one degrees, these small oligomers can give quite intense uh, plasmonic CD responses. So indeed, we found when we add uh, Terra system into this non terra uh, oligomers, we can observe very obvious plasmonic CD responses, and the plasmonic CD sign are actually controlled by the kinetic of the molecules. In contrast, if the non terra cells are added, actually, no no plasmonic CD signals is observed. This means our strategy for fabricating the plasmonic chiral uh, assemblies can be uh, realized based on the uh, uh, surgeon and uh, solder effects. To test the universality of our procedure, we actually uh, change the uh, surface composition and the road spacing. And we found by changing the plasmonic composition, we can still uh, obtain the plasmonic CD responses. And the road spacing actually uh, play a very important role. By changing the road spacing, the PCD sign can be reversed. Uh, furthermore, to know the mechanism behind this uh, chiral uh, transfer, we annealing this, uh, we annealing this uh, chiral uh, oligomers in the elevated temperature. And we actually found a plasmonic CD temperature amplification effect. It can lead to very large uh, G-factor. And this actually is uh, uh, counterintuitively because uh, uh, first actually we want to use the heating to reduce the structure uh, chirality, but we observe an opposite phenomenon. And this PCD temperature amplification effect can also be observed in other plasmonic composition, like in silver exposed uh, SBS uh, oligomers. But the uh, annealing temperature are limited to a lower temperature. And also we found actually the chiral patches formed between the chiral molecules is very important to get the very large chiral activities. Uh, and we also found the this kind of uh, PCD temperature amplification effects are also dependent on the uh, pH. So we can use pH to switch the PCD response and also to cycle these PCD responses. So now I go to the second part, as I mentioned before. <coughs> uh, we can use the local field enhancement to improve the uh, chiral dipole and uh, the plasma interaction. So in this way to increase the plasmonic CD responses. 
So we use also good nano road and adsorb the carrier cell like cysteine to its surface and then grows the silver cell to form the uh, co-cell structure. Indeed, uh, upon the formation of co-cell structure, we can also observe the uh, obvious plasmonic CD responses uh, from these discrete nanostructures. It means this is a, a hot spot effect is a useful way to uh, improve the plasmonic, uh, plasmonic CD responses. Also, we found like uh, the shape play an important role by decreasing the aspect ratio of the crucial structure. Actually, we observed the de uh, declined plasmonic CD responses. And in the spherical crucial structure, actually, uh, the PCD response is negligible. Uh, this means the shape has an important role in the plasmonic CD responses. Uh, previous, the, the fabrication of the discrete chiral structure is mainly made by the uh, top-down uh, top -down strategy where various uh, micro and uh, nano fabrication method. I, I, I think the previous uh, three speakers mostly use this uh, micro nano fabrication to get their structure, also the metal surface, surfaces. In recent three years, uh, the chemical synthesis of this kind of uh, 3D chiral structure actually uh, made, a great, uh, made a great breakthrough. For instance, for instance, in, two, in 2018, Professor Nami's group demonstrated like use chiral guided growth. They can synthesize chiral plasmonic golden nano uh, structures and they can be used as uh, broad, broadband polarizer. And uh, in, in last year, uh, also Professor Liz Mother's group, they use uh, uh, methyl guided chiral growth. Also uh, on the golden nano road, they get this uh, uh, helic growth of the gold shell on the golden nano road. Also observed a very large uh, plasmonic uh, CD responses. So this achievement means now we can also use a white chemical method to obtain the 3D discrete chiral plasmonic nanostructure and made progress for their future use as the metal materials. And recently our group will also use a small kind of cells as as an adjuvant and uh, get the discrete helic plasmonic nano road with tunable kind of optical properties. Uh, and this kind of material may be useful for the chiral uh, uh, catalysis because they have very, uh, very fine tuning in the hot spot. So have a very large uh, near Asymmetric field. Uh, now I uh, come to the conclusion. So about the second part, this dynamic chiral plasmonic uh, superstructures, uh, we use this uh, surgeon and soldier effect to realize the uh, cross lens. Uh, transfer of chirality from molecule to uh, chiroplasmonic superstructures. And we found a PCD temperature uh, um, amplification effect and the 
plasmonic uh, crystalline facet has a big, big influence. Uh, about uh, discrete terrier plasmonic nanostructure, we realize a hotspot enhanced PCD amplification in anisotropic co-shell nanostructured. And we also obtained the discrete helicoplasmonic nano road use small carrier molecules. And we found shape dependence of hotspot enhanced dipole plasma interaction. And we also found the composition dependent PCD sign. And together in both these two systems, we actually found a lot of interest phenomena, uh, but we know actually <clears throat> we need more effort to, to explore the chirality car transfer mechanism behind. In that way, we, we may have a chance to rationally design the fabrication of this uh, chiral plasmonic nanostructure and the superstructure and tuning their and finally to realize their various applications. Now I go to the acknowledgement. So I would like to thank the three students of mine who contribute to today's talk. Dr. Ho Shui, he is now a PhD candidate in Nanyang Technology University of Singapore. Dr. Uh, Yan Jiao, he is now also a post <coughs> Research in Changchun Institute of Applied Chemistry class. De Jing is a PhD candidate, uh, candidate and also another two professors for collaboration and the financial support for NSF most and CAS. And finally, thank you for your attention. I'm sorry because I'm not familiar with the, 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 this uh, conference. <laughs> So now my talk is end here. Okay, uh, thank you Xiaochun for the uh, great talk. Uh, I save a few minutes for the discussion. Uh, in this session, we'll have a moderator, uh, Professor Uriel Levy, um, yeah. I guess. Professor Levy is the uh, expert of the field. Question, did you use uh, your plasmonic structure to separate, to do the opposite thing and uh, separate between the nanotubes? Can you speak again? I didn't get what you... Did you use your plasmonic structure, the chiral plasmonic, you could use them maybe to separate between two different chirality, between small uh, two nanotubes? Do the opposite thing. You're using as a precursor, now you could do for separation. Uh, uh, I, I, I think maybe now the structure size is a little bit large for the separation of in antimers. Okay. Mm -hmm. I mean, the chemical recognition is more important. But for carrier catalysis, I think maybe we have a chance there. Okay, interesting. May I ask a question? This is Itamar Vilna. Sure. Hello, Go. Professor Vilna. Mm -hmm. You are yeah. expert for DNA technolo technologies. <laughs> uh, what I think is there are two methods to get the chiroplasmonic effects of nanostructure. One is to use a chiral coating, and the second one is to get a chiral structure. I mean, yeah, yeah. two particles are in an asymmetric configuration. I think that <clears throat> in your case, the main effect originates from chiral coatings on the gold particles. Am I right? Uh, no, I, I, I think actually I, I, I have presented two kinds of structure. One is a discrete kind of, uh, structures, and another one is like 
casual acceptance. So I mean, for the first one, I think is you you can think it is like casual voting, but in the second one, I mean, it's more like a, a structure casuality because it's really quite large. By the way, I think that the future of chiroplasmonic structures of gold of gold nanostructure rests on um, the catalytic, the possible chiroselective <laughs> catalytic properties of these structures. I tried to interest several Chinese uh, scientists that are working on these chiroplasmonic structures to try to take these chiral structures, for example, to selectively oxidize glucose, D-glucose and L-glucose. And I wonder whether you have any uh, results that can show that you can use them for electrocatalysis. Uh, actually, no, I, I, I have one problem is like, because the photothermal effect, actually they play a more important role for the thermal catalysis. So actually now the near field, uh, asymmetric near field enhancement, uh, we haven't uh, succeeded due to this uh, local photothermal effects, they actually interference for the casual catalysis. So I, I think we need to find a way to exclude the local thermal effects. Thank you. Thank you. So, Professor Nid, do you would like to try to summarize this session? Oh, all right. Um, I'm so pleased uh, to uh, join this first session of our uh, bilateral Israelis uh, Chinese uh, symposium. I think uh, we have uh, today four speakers, uh, two from Israeli side, they are Moti and Tao, and two speakers from Chinese side, Qing and Xiao Chun. Uh, all of the all of these uh, speakers give wonderful talks in their field. So I guess the uh, after this series of interactions, I think we uh, two sides scientists will get a deeper understanding. Uh, so I really wish we, uh, through this uh, type of uh, uh, interactions uh, during this uh, post uh, uh, COVID-19 area, so we, 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 we would like to further enhance the interaction with the Chinese, uh, uh, the Israeli scientist. So, so I just, uh, was, was final words, to thank all of the speakers again for the wonderful talks. Okay, very nice, thank you. I also think that uh, thinking about the subject, which seem to be interconnect, plasmonic, metamaterials, chirality, and uh, topology, which relate to chir some to chirality, I think there's a lot of room for collaboration between us that should be enhanced, and I hope to be, that we'll move to person whenever uh, we go or we meet in person, and of course we can do it as Tal was suggesting, even submit grants together and uh, in as a collaboration online. So thank you very much, all mm -hmm. the speakers, for this very entitled or enlightening uh, session and uh, co mini conference. Well, so, I think that yeah. I would like to say one, one word of thank you for everybody. First of all, the speakers for their talks, I realize how difficult it is to overcome these technical issues. Secondly, the excellent science that was demonstrated here. And thirdly, and most importantly, is the collaboration between China and Israel. And I think that this webinar is just the start to continue and to see what the other three webinars will demonstrate, and I'm sure we will have wonderful collaborative efforts. Thank you, all of you, for your efforts. Thank you. Thank you. Let, let me introduce, uh, before he give, introduce Professor Levy, who will moderate the last discussion, I just want to say that since we're all talking about phase and uh, phase conservation, maybe we can talk also about now quantum 
nano devices and nano photonics going to the next stage where now topology and quantum is very popular and maybe this, we can add this to the discussion that we have now. Aurel, your turn. Okay. Uh, so yeah, first let me join uh, everybody for, for the greetings. Uh, really nice, some nice talks uh, today. Uh, it's not easy to have everything in uh, online. Of course, there's value to meet each other and we are missing that. But I hope it will come uh, very soon. So I think now officially we can start the, uh, the panel, the, the discussion. And the uh, first question, of course, would be, what's next? Where are we going next from here? Uh, how are we seeing photonics in general and nanophotonics in particular um, making progress and impact for the next decade or so? And uh, maybe we'll start with you, Moti. Okay, so actually, in my opinion, the next decade will be the decade of uh, quantum photonics, specifically, and I will tell you why, photonic quantum computation specifically, I will tell you why. And all the, the procedures, all the platforms for quantum computing so far, suggested so far, depend on gates, all of them except for one, what we call one-way uh, one uh, quantum computing, which is really dedicated to photons, to photonics specifically, and to silicon photonics apparently. And I will tell you why. Now, the, the logic behind that is that when you want to have quant a quantum computer, what you need is actually that a quantum state will act as a switch or some switching device and will switch another quantum state, okay? So that, that is called in the jargon, it's called a two qubit gate, two qubit, okay? In other words, what you want, let's say that you have an atom and you will come by with a quantum state on a single photon or two photons, and you want to switch it such that the first photon goes by, come the second photon is back reflected or gets a pi phase shift or something of that order, okay? To do that when atoms, between photons and atoms, it's extremely hard. Uh, it is done by Rydberg atoms, which means that you need to excite the atom to some excited state, 50 something state, something that Misha Lukin did and at that time Offer Fürstenberg was his postdoc and for that he got a position at Weizmann Institute. Okay, but generally speaking, this is quite hard. Probably the world leading experimentalist on this today is Manuel Enders at Caltech. There are others, another method is using uh, uh, ion traps and of course using superconducting uh, quantum bits, which Google and uh, IBM are doing. But all of these methods rely on gates and all of them have a major problem with scalability because to be able to do something useful in a quantum computer, you need something on the order of, of 10 to the six, a million physical qubits, physical qubits, okay? And that is very, very hard. There is only one platform that is fundamentally different. It is the, the one-way one, which is the photonic one, which takes advantage of the fact that, uh, that, that in the absence of gates, the detection process of photons can serve as a gate. So the idea behind the uh, quantum, I would say uh, the one-way quantum photonics or the, the, the one-way quantum computing, which is uh, really designed for a photonic platform, is to have an optical circuit, a photonic circuit, let's say on silicon, that goes like this, okay? And you launch a cluster state, and on the other side of it, you take a measurement, which is an ordinary coincidence measurement that is done in quantum optics, and then take the measurement through a, an ordinary computer, classical computer, figure out what you measured, and based on that, switch the system. And reconfigure your system. But this requires no gate at all. The reconfiguration is done. How would okay. you do the manipulation, the Adamard gates, the flipping of the bits? The, the exactly like this. You know, so this is a universal quantum computing scheme. What you need is to manipulate, this, the, manipulate the, the, the configuration of the setting through switches, okay? The state of the art today is in three places. Unfortunately, it's not in the academia. One of them is in a company by the name of Psy Quantum, led by two very good people, experimentalist uh, uh, Jeremy O'Brien and the, the theorist uh, Terry Rudolph, who is the grandson of Schrodinger. The other one is Xanadu. And the third one is in China. Okay, don't be mistaken. Jan Wei Pan appears, his name is on the paper, but he's not deleting this one. 
but they had several hundred people on this paper and they just published a paper in Nature, which is not integrated. In other words, what, you, what they had is many, many, many people holding little, little uh, uh, components. And this is how they did the, this without switching, just one way, which amounts to boson sampling. But the future is in an integrated platform. And the reason behind that is that the photonic platform can be upgraded to 10 to the 6, 10 to the 7 components on a chip without major difficulties. It is, does require state-of-the-art fabrication, but the world is there. The, the microelectronic companies are not that far from this. This, in my opinion, will beat all the other quantum computers, and this will become the dominant platform. For I, I am sure of that. The only one that could be uh, could beat it, maybe, is the Rydberg atoms, but I doubt that that also because you will need to put the Rydberg atoms on a chip, and to this day nobody did not ion traps and not Rydberg atoms that can do something on a chip. People did generate the, the, the ion traps on a chip, but not a computation, not, nothing of that sort. We are far, too far from that. So I believe actually in the photonic quantum computing scheme, which is one way, and that will be the next decade. Thank you, Moti. I will ask the same question. Uh, uh, I'll send the question to Professor Dai for the same question. Oh, he's on mute, I think. Yeah. Yeah. So maybe we will move uh, uh, to you, Professor Nai. Uh, would you like to answer the same question? Uh, you ask me? <laughs> yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, uh, I'm sorry, I'm not the people in the field, so uh, I can't talk about the very deep uh, uh, image for the future. But I, I think this is hot topic. Yeah, so worth a lot of discussion. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, okay, and the same question uh, for for Tal. Tal, what do you think? Where are we going next decade? Okay, so uh, I think that uh, to complement what uh, Moti said, uh, we have a very good uh, and uh, something that will contribute to uh, everything that he said and to other things. Uh, with respect to integration, we have very good uh, capabilities to fabricate uh, 2D uh, in-plane devices on chip. But uh, we don't have much much uh, capabilities to uh, get the same characteristics in uh, three dimensions. So I think that uh, over the next uh, decade, uh, the 3D printing, nano printing uh, will evolve considerably and should evolve. And this will uh, boost the degrees of freedom uh, to control photonic devices in all applications. And this is definitely a direction that uh, will uh, need to be taken and uh, will uh, help the technologies to evolve. That's it, very short. <laughs> By the way, Moti, what you said about like uh, Riedberg atoms, I think Riedberg is really a good candidate. And uh, in my opinion, there is, a, there is a possibility to have Riedberg atoms on a chip. Uh, so, so one of the challenges, of course, Riedberg atom kind of take, takes volume. So you have to take it far away from the surface, few microns from the surface. This is the main challenge. Uh, well, the problem is scalability, Uriel. It's not an issue to make, two, uh, let's say, 10 or even 2,000. What you need is on the order of 10 to the 6. I don't see anyone making 10 to the 6 traps, not for ions and also not for Rydbergs. I agree that in the short run, probably ion traps when the, and, of course, superconductors, uh, superconductor qubits, will probably beat the race in the short run, but they will do a quantum computer that is, can do nothing important. I mean, no, yes, no, it, I it can give you some nice headlines in the newspapers. No, That's I don't it. Agree with this, uh, Moti. 10 to the 6 gate and 10 to, the, 10 to the 6 qubits and 10 to the 12 gate is for solving short algorithm or something like no, that. No, 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 no. I actually you have to do the calculation you can do with less. With yes, that. but you need fault tolerance. This introduces redundancy. Since the fault sure. tolerance, 
So I'm telling you what is the people that the, the experts in the in the quantum computing part, not in the physics part. Yeah. Okay. They right now the assessment is that to do something useful, not only show algorithm, you need 10 to the six to be optimistic. Okay. You need at least 10 to the six to have reasonable, reasonable, uh, uh, you know, fault tolerance, or I would say bitter or eight. Yeah. That is reasonable. Okay. Otherwise, one can play games. You know, uh, the bo you know boson sampling in in this case is also like a game. It's yes, it's quantum, and it is very nice, but it is not useful. Yes, it can beat classical, but it's again, it's not useful. I it's useful with, for any problem that is useful, not only show algorithm. I agree with you that, op that optics can do coupling, which is uh, the the main problem for scalability. Do circuitry. Optics can do circuitry. Which Thank today you. all the others can do up to well, let's say a hundred, maybe a bit more, and even that, by the way, so far at least, all the uh, the ion traps on the chip, which exist already for let's say at least five, six, eight years, did not show computation on the chip. All the computation with ion traps was done in a chamber, not on a chip, and uh, on the Rydbergs are even further away from that. To do processing to, on the chip and put their atoms or Rydbergs or whatever is, it's not clear that it's scalable. Also another thing I think that there are nanophotonics on top of the supporting quantum technology. There are lots of uh, other topics uh, that could benefit from, from, uh, from nanophotonics in general, also for the next future. So, uh, okay. So we know, for example, silicon photonics, there was buzz about silicon photonics and then it dies, but what if uh, all the data center now will play a role now? So you see data center is emerging yes. and it gives new life to, to silicon photonics. So this is one thing that could uh, make a huge difference. Yeah. In other ways, already, limit... going, already going there. Data yeah. centers are transferring more and more to silicon photonics. That's already true. So I think this is another uh, ghost mechanism for, for nanophotonics. So Riel, what is the future for plasmonics? Uh, since we heard three talks about plasmonics. Uh, yeah, I have a very, very uh, unusual opinion on that. What will remain, everything will die. What will remain, <laughs> metamaterials will die. The only thing that will remain is metasurfaces that when I was a student, we used to call them gratings. <laughs> so you want to give them, you want to give them a new name, you can call them Moses. Okay. <laughs> so so as, you, as we all know, metasurfaces, uh, it's actually a very old topic with a more fashionable name. Yes. Uh, yeah. Uh, and, and grating later on diffractive. When, when you were a student, it was grating. When I was a student, it was diffractive optics. <laughs> now it's metasurface. Uh, but there are lots of opportunities in metasurfaces. No, definitely. Yeah. But only the surface will remain. Everything that in the volume, in my opinion, will die because you have yeah. too much loss. And also think of that, For, uh, when you deal with surface, it's compatible with CMOS technology. Yeah. When you deal with volume, it's like yeah. something else. Yeah, yeah. I agree. Well, I, agree. Well, I think that there, we, there is something that uh, has to be developed, how to deal with the volume. No, the, the one that will do that uh, in a way that uh, you can do something useful will win a lot of credit. Okay, so, so, far, I, it didn't so I have a term 2.5 dimension metal yeah. surface. Actually, Tal was going along this way when he had this three layer of plasmonic uh, device for RGB. So things like that might help, might be reasonable. Few layers, let's say, few yeah. layers of metal surfaces. Yeah, and I think also we heard from the Chinese side going along those lines. So yeah. this is a very nice opportunity. I agree. So do you yeah. want Professor Ni to summarize maybe uh, the discussion today? Yeah, uh, so I, I wouldn't want to say more words. Uh, just uh, once again, thank you all of you for your contribution to this uh, uh, webinar. And we are very looking for the next three ones. In the, in, in most of them will be in uh, April to June, right? Yeah. So we're very looking for this, yeah. Thank you. Itamar? Yeah, I think that we, that on behalf of the Academy, I think, I thank all people that worked so hard to bring this, uh, um, <clears throat> this uh, webinar into a working function. 
And um, I look forward for the next three webinars. I'm sure that they will be a success, at least as the one that is was today. And I thank everybody from the technical staff and most importantly to the scientific staff. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Yes. Bye bye, everybody. Bye bye. Bye. Bye.